And now we have our next speaker for today, a really exciting session together with Sven Turnquist. Welcome, Sven. Uh, and Sven is head of digital business development at EQT. He has 20 years of experience working with digitalization, technology, sales, marketing, um, and marketing across several industries. And he's also held positions such as head of digital at Ericsson and country manager uh, Sweden at Google. And today, Sven will talk about using customer insights systematically to grow your retail and e-commerce business. So welcome, Sven. Uh, we're super excited to have you here and the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, so I'm going to get it over uh, my, my least interesting slide right away. Um, this is a short summary of what Maria said, what I've been up to in my career. Uh, the, the logo here to the top right, EQT, uh, a little bit more of what I'm doing here, because I think that might be a little bit of interest to you. Um, those of you who don't know EQT, it's uh, one of the large, uh, really large uh, private equity companies or, or alternative a a investment companies, as, as the term is. Uh, we invest in private companies uh, in uh, any size uh, and, and in any stage. That means that we have a venture fund. We have a growth fund for, for uh, scale-ups. We have a large bio fund. We have mid-market funds. We also buy infrastructure like railways or fiber or uh, ports. Uh, we have a real estate fund. And so we, we're doing a lot. And, and uh, um, our, our clients essentially are uh, pension funds uh, across the world uh, who want to see a return on their invested capital. Um, so our idea is to buy companies, uh, make them better, and then sell them in five years. And, and what's great about that is that you have a five-year horizon without the pressure of a public uh, environment. So there's no quarterly report chasing you, but you can actually focus on the long term uh, and, and drive digital transformation as it is. Uh, and that's exactly what my team does. We're, we're a 20 people strong team, all of us from, from uh, digital native companies like uh, uh, Spotify, King, uh, and Google, uh, and, and similar. And we do exactly this. We help our portfolio companies and management teams to drive uh, their transformation. And typically, we like to focus on growth aspects. So uh, today, uh, uh, we're all about customers, of course. And, and uh, uh, let's start by, by thinking about these customers, a little bit tying into what we heard here uh, in, the, in the initial. Uh, this image, I think, represents very well uh, how, thing, how customers are today. These are individuals with uh, some pretty cool uh, superpowers. This has been going on now for, for 30 years. Um, one way to look at it is that pre-1990s, we had uh, a Neanderthal customer, a, a um, uh, you know, significantly weaker than any seller in terms of, of information they had access to. But with the dawn of the, of the World Wide Web, all information on products and prices came online. A few years later, it became infinitely more useful because we started to see useful search engines like, like Google in 1998. And this meant that a lot of traffic search, so this was one of the first big step changes to, uh, uh, to, the, to the industry because uh, they, um, uh, uh, it, it grew so much more traffic. Uh, it became more user-friendly. People found that information that they, were, they, were, they, they needed. From a consumer journey standpoint, of course, uh, this was a lot of price comparison and, and, uh, and simple stuff. Later, in the, in the early 2000s, uh, people started coming online. We saw the dawn of social. This means that consumer journeys were, were influenced by what other people thought. If you were looking for a customer data platform, you might go to LinkedIn and see, do I have contacts or friends that are, are uh, uh, com uh, competent in this, uh, in this domain? Uh, if I'm going to Barcelona on a weekend trip, I might go on Facebook and, and ask friends uh, who have been there recently what to see, what to do, where to eat, etc. Uh, so this was another important um, uh, aspect of, of this, you know, a new superpower. Uh, and then in the last 10 years, we've seen, uh, since 2007, I should say, smartphones and, and uh, the mobile revolution. And, this is um, so incredibly important. Uh, we, we tend to overfocus on small screens and, and, uh, and those aspects, and, or, oh, many devices, it's hard to do attribution and tracking, et cetera, yes. But another meta aspect of it is, it brings me back to 
the history when IBM introduced email to facilitate their internal communication. This was in the 1980s. It became an instant hit and IBM employees everywhere loved it. But in a few days, the system just broke down and, and servers just, uh, you know, uh, they, they caught fire. And why? Well, they had designed this system for on the, on the patterns of the, 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 the old behavior uh, and the need for the old needs for, for internal messaging. It turns out that people, when they got access to email, uh, started communicating five to six times more than they did before. Not because they needed to, because they could. So this is exactly what's happening with, with mobile, right? We, we have access 24 seven. We have devices that keep us plugged into all the world's information on all the world's products, and all the world's people all the time. So this has made the modern day consumer a, a fascinating uh, superhero uh, in a sense. And, and it's important to note that the customers are still mutating uh, and becoming ever more sophisticated in terms of how they use these superpowers. This is one way of looking at this. The, the black downward slanting uh, slope is uh, searches on Google for cheap. So, so the old, you know, somewhat less uh, newbie behavior. I'm, I'm looking for to buy something. I want to find out how much it costs. Now the red bar is growing infinitely faster and, and uh, much, much higher. Uh, and that's best. This signifies this more sophisticated behavior where consumers are looking for expertise and recommendations. And yet, as consumers are mutating from price comparison to expertise and recommendation, most companies still answer every query on Google or any interaction online with the reply, buy now, which is of course uh, not, uh, not the, the right answer to most consumer questions consumers ask themselves. COVID, uh, thinking about mutation, let's, let's talk about this virus a little bit more. Um, this is the next wave, next, the, the last big impact wave to, to, to consumers. Uh, and uh, of course, we're talking here about adoption. This is a forced adoption triggered by COVID. If we look at the, the arguably the most uh, uh, sophisticated e-commerce nation, the UK, we've seen that they went from 30%, which is massive in itself, penetration. The e-commerce share of, of total retail in the UK was 30%. That in and out stack satellites on, on 40 percent. So you can see the red bar, this step change that, that COVID triggered. If we look at uh, online grocery, which is of course one of those categories that will never be fully online, it's still doubled in one year uh, thanks to COVID from 10 percent, from 5 percent to 10 percent. So it's so massive. And if we then look at uh, digital service products like, like uh, uh, video conferencing tools, uh, this is doubled not in a year, but in a couple of months. Uh, so, so what will happen and what will be the new, uh, the new normal and the steady state? We don't know, but my bet is that we won't go back to, to before COVID. Uh, this has is, this is changed and it's changed forever. Lastly, uh, the, uh, uh, let, let's call it the subtle virus uh, is uh, from something that uh, Fjord, uh, the, the uh, uh, the only uh, consulting company that Accenture acquired, I think, got, got to keep their name. Uh, they call this perceptual competitors. So these are competitors that the companies that offer these exceptional uh, customer experiences. These experiences are so powerful that they actually transcend their own verticals and, and shape customer expectations for everyone. So thinking about this, Amazon, uh, their short delivery windows has set the bar for any company uh, in terms of delivery and any company in terms of immediacy. If you think about Spotify, that's probably the world leader in terms of personalization as well as Discover. Uh, they can really, uh, it's an amazing uh, company in terms, my, my, my experience is unique from anyone else and, and it's, it's keep, it keeps delivering that uh, on a daily basis to me, which is, which is quite uh, remarkable. And uh, probably the, the uh, uh, the extreme leader here, uh, again, coming back to Netflix, this is what you rates the most loved brand and uh, uh, the, the, the brand that sets the bars for everyone else. Uh, they have reshaped the way people consume content, uh, how we uh, look at TV, how we think about TV, cinema going, storytelling, and pop culture. And by the way, their service costs between 10 to 20 euros a month.
that's another thing, right? Thinking about pricing and the value they, they deliver, it's quite remarkable. So uh, it's not all doom and gloom, of course. Uh, those of us who work in uh, commercial roles trying to sell stuff, we need to, we need to uh, find a positive angle on this. And there is, of course, because there is such a thing as corporate superpowers. Um, if we think about data, as we heard, there, there's more data on customers out there than ever before. There are tools available to analyze, to capture that data and analyze it. So there's, there's sort, sort of a, a, an opportunity to be better than any, everyone else. Looking at automation, that's, that's exactly what we can do here. We can, we can mass produce unique experiences if we get this right. And the cloud is what powers it all. It makes it use, usable and quite cost effective to actually do so. And looking specifically at software for bespoke usage in marketing and sales, we've seen that this, this uh, software uh, category has grown from 150 bespoke solutions back in 2011 to 8,000 today. This super graph is, uh, is made by a, a friend of mine, uh, Scott Brinker, uh, who runs a blog on, on marketing technology uh, uh, that I recommend you to follow if you don't already. Really, really uh, extreme growth. And, and we've yet to see consolidation. And back to Stefan's point, it seems like best of breed is definitely winning over those large platforms, which, uh, which is not surprising because the, the dynamics in the industry uh, uh, require innovation from anywhere. I think that makes total sense. So um, if we think about this, for savvy players, this all is great news. If we are to buy into what Gib William Gibson says here, there is an opportunity to acquire and use those superpowers slash technology better than, than uh, competitors. And uh, uh, personally, I think the key word here is to use technology, not acquire. And let's, let's go back and look at an example, Don. America runs on Boulevatine. You might have seen this before. This is the first TV ad ever broadcast in the United States back in 1941. Uh, uh, I think Boulevard paid something like $9 for this ad. So it's fun, fascinating, right? You have this power of television, moving images and sound. And, and essentially what we're seeing here is a print ad with sound over it. And this makes total sense because at the time there was TV, sorry, there was radio and there was print. And there were, TV was an unknown uh, unit, right? Nobody knew how to figure out an, or, or do moving images. Of course, the cinema industry had been around, but, but there were no people in cinema working for the advertising industry. So essentially what you saw is a print ad with some sound on it uh, and very little usage of, of that technology. This is exactly what a lot of digital marketing and customer experiences online look like today. It's a print using pixels, I would say. So here's an example. This is uh, Dagens Nyheter, the, the biggest daily in Sweden. And they have a big ad here on uh, trips to the sun. Um, and, and of course, this is, a, this is not a brand ad. This is, this is meant to actually sell trips to the sun. But the same day I screenshotted this, I also made this screenshot on, on uh, the temperature in, in, uh, in Stockholm. What's, what's actually, um, what's the propensity, do you think, to actually buy a trip to the sun when it's 22 degrees nice and warm outside. Very much lower, I would imagine, than when it's 8 degrees and raining. So, so uh, could you trigger this? Could you actually make an ad that triggers on when, when, when the, uh, the, the propensity to get clicks is the highest? Yes, of course you could. Yet we're not doing it because we're buying online as if we're buying print. That's still happening everywhere we look. This is another example. What you're looking at here is the biggest classified sites for real estate in Sweden. And this is Borlänge, which is a rural city uh, in the north and a an, uh, 70,000 K uh, apartment. So um, what do you think the likelihood are, are that people interested in this apartment would like to add to that a Sonos sound system for 3,000 uh, euros? So there's a disconnect here. There is data. Oh, I mean, you can just look at these images and you can see that this makes no sense. And yet, this is what the, what the state of the industry is still today. And thinking about this, um, 
we come into sort of transformations and, and where do they succeed and where they succeed and where do they fail. Most transformations fail to have a meaningful impact. Most of that failure depend on people's resistance to doing things different as opposed to technology. I personally experienced this more times than, than I care to recall. Uh, BCG came out with this report uh, not long ago uh, that I found, found very uh, insightful. They say that you know if you focus on the cultural aspects to, to have a culture that allows for failure, uh, test and learn and, and experimentation where you have very flat hierarchies and, and you, you leverage data in every way, you know, they found that you can, you can be so much more successful. And that's actually one of the significant uh, 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 factors in terms of succeeding with a digital transformation. So I want to talk to you, uh, use my rest of my time here to uh, share some examples of how we work at EKT with our portfolio companies to actually install a customer-centric culture uh, where we can do, uh, you know, mine data and, and use it to install this culture that we talked about. There is always data. My favorite place to start with is uh, often when I come into a new vertical and I don't understand much about it, is Google Trends. This example is from uh, Musti Group, which is a large pet specialty retailer in the Nordics. Uh, in Sweden, it's called Arken Zoo. And uh, what we're looking at here is uh, the demand patterns for dog transport cages. And what you can see here is, is a map where that tells me that, oh, interestingly, uh, this, this category, which incidentally a dog transport cage can cost between 150 euros to 1500 euros, sometimes 2000 euros. So, so that's, uh, it's a high ticket item, the highest in any pet specialty retail uh, business. And, and we see that it's much more, much more demand, for, uh, relatively speaking, from rural areas of Sweden. Why that is? Well, maybe they have more dogs, maybe they travel longer distances with dogs. I don't know, maybe both. It also see, you know, we also see a, a, a pattern here of, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, seasonality pattern. And then if I export that in CSV and run an analysis and overlay with calendar events, I see something interesting. Uh, I see that the, there are certain periods where there's an outsized demand for dog transport cages and a lot of yellow slash red uh, areas here where, where there's lower demand than average. And when I look into what happened uh, in, in conjunction with those times, it, it's a pattern emerges. Every week before a large holiday, Easter, the winter holiday, Ascension Day, uh, Valpurgis, Midsummer, you see an increase in demand because that's where Swedes travel. And when they travel, they want their dogs with them. So, so why is this useful? Well, I, know, I now know when I should stock, off, stock, stock up on, on dog transport cages when I should market dog transport cages in my, my newsletters or, or external media, and where and which regions I should uh, focus on. So rinse, repeat for every category and you have something quite, uh, uh, quite useful. There's always data available, as said. Netflix uh, is so good at international rollout that their Harvard Business Review has written about it uh, quite recently, in fact. And the way they do this is a central team from California sit with lots of smartness. So when they, for instance, look at Bulgaria, they would use VPN to place themselves virtually in Bulgaria. And then they will go on to uh, torrent sites to look at what's the, the piracy behavior and, and to, um, just to understand what kind of content is popular in Bulgaria. And, and they use that intelligence to make sure they have the right content rights away as, uh, as well as uh, uh, fronting the right content in the marketing, which is, uh, which is super cool. Another example is uh, uh, contextual data, which I still, you know, this is uh, one of the oldest tactics in the book, but uh, it still pays off in spades. Uh, this is an example of um, uh, the classified site, the pet site uh, on, on uh, uh, the classifieds uh, uh, in, uh, in Sweden. And as you can see here, there's a filler ad from a gambling company buying, uh, so, so why would I suddenly become interested in, in, in gambling when I'm looking for, for pet classifieds? that? I'm not sure. But when we made a move with our company Nutrima uh, that make uh, dog food uh, and replaced the, uh, uh, the filler ads with our ads, we got a, a click-through rate of 3.8, 
which is, uh, for those of you who know, uh, uh, display marketing astronomically high. So we're super excited about that. Um, this is an example of, uh, we're, not, we're now in Germany, we're looking at female fashion and uh, a company called Cecile, uh, which uh, operates both stores and online. Uh, it's an omnichannel uh, specialty, uh, women uh, fashion specialist. And uh, they, of course, live in the world of H&M uh, and Salando and need to be smarter in terms of, of marketing. And we work with them to try to understand uh, seasonality patterns again, uh, to see if we can optimize their campaign in, in some way or form. And when we look, uh, sort of look at the, uh, this example is winter jacket, dame, so, so uh, fall jacket or winter jacket. We see that there's a pretty obvious pattern uh, in terms of demand. But to understand that on a more granular level, we did the same trick. We, we exported this to see is there a cutoff place that we, that we you know, some, some, some sharp trend that we can use. And as you can see here, you have that sharp trend between the 25th of September and the 2nd of, uh, of October, something dramatic uh, happened. And clearly we hypothesized that this had to do with weather. And when we did overlay the weather, you can see here that there's a long period of really nice weather in Germany for, for this period, sun and, and high temperatures. But suddenly, October 2nd, temperatures drop and it starts to rain. And what happens then is of course that this triggers a lot of German women putting on their old jackets from last year, saying, oh my God, I can't wear this old rag. I need to get a new, uh, a new uh, winter jacket. And while they're on their way to work or on their lunch breaks, they go on their smartphones, they type in winter jacket, damen in Google, and they buy something. So, so again, the usefulness here is knowing when to, uh, to uh, really double down and, and maybe outbid uh, Salando and H&M and other competitors for a certain category because we have more data and more smartness in our, in our company. Rinse, repeat for every product category. Lastly, uh, I want to share with you, uh, we're going to stay in Germany, uh, but we're going to talk about rats and pest control. Um, Antisemex uh, is a, a household brand in Sweden, but in Germany, they only have, uh, they are the, their market leader, but they only have a couple of percent market share, which means that this is a, very, very fragmented market with, uh, with a lot of mom and pop shops. So we realized that, that you know, in order to, uh, uh, to be relevant here, you need to, you need to understand the, the search behavior and, and the, uh, uh, the, customer, the customer journey here. And, and if you're not uh, present in uh, uh, searches like Schädlums become from Hamburg, as is the example here, which I'm seeing this was not, then you're not gonna get uh, uh, the, the customers in either. So uh, we, we initially started to, to just make sure that anti-CMX actually were uh, on, uh, present on, on Google searches. Uh, however, it, didn't, it grew, a lot of grew a lot of traffic, but it didn't convert at all because we had this big national brand, anti-CMX, and that's not what German uh, consumers had expected. They had expected something, uh, you know, a mom and pop shop, and uh, we couldn't understand why we, why we couldn't convert more customers. When we started producing hyper-local landing pages, things changed. So if the, the question was, Schädlums became from Bremen, we would route them to a landing page under antisemix.de that looked like Bremen, had a landmark of Bremen. Everything else is the same, right? It's just the image and the, 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 uh, the geographical uh, uh, target, uh, uh, tag here that is different. All the phone numbers and forms are exactly the same. But this, of course, changed everything, right? So we had a 6x conversion uplift, cost per lead came down dramatically, and um, um, I'm not sure why this is one with me here. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, uh, a, a re really significant impact also on sales, which means that, uh, uh, okay, now my, uh, it's certainly something wrong. I can't show you what happened with sales. So there's an 83% uplift uh, for the, uh, uh, our sales reps in anti -CMX, which we found fun was of course very cool. Let's now see if I can get to the next slide. So to tie this up, 
Companies that learn to leverage data and achieve digital maturity, what's the actual value of that? Uh, let's look at that. Um, we like to go to this one. It's an oldie, but it's been updated many times. This is a study done by MIT that looked at hundreds of uh, large companies in every vertical. What they did were two things. They, they looked at it for a longer period of time and, and tried to uh, uh, identify a way to measure digital maturity. They did so in two dimensions and, and uh, without going into deep detail, uh, the x-axis is, uh, is how well do you, uh, how much do you do? How, how, uh, sorry, how much, how well are you, your strategy and your coordination? Do you have a, a, uh, a management and a board who is focused on this and, and, and a coherent program for transformation or do, are you letting a thousand flowers bloom? Uh, and the other, uh, on the on the y-axis, is the terms of activity. How much are you doing? Are you doing a lot uh, in the top or uh, not so much in the bottom? And then, of course, they overlaid what is the impact on financial KPIs. And it turns out that, of course, a digital mature company grow faster. They're also valued more and their profitability, i.e. their efficiency, is a lot higher. So. This is just one obvious example. I recommend it because it's, it's uh, probably the, the most um, um, advanced study out there. But a number of companies, McKinsey and BCG among them, have replicated these studies and found that there's actually a super strong correlation between uh, digital maturity and financial performance. So be thinking about this, where to start with your digital transformation. BCG would tell us that, well, marketing and sales is the place to start because that's where the EBIT impact sits. I would like to add to that that actually it is the best place to start because it focuses on customer insights that can be created, that can be harvested and create value for the entire organization. It also provides proof of concept and early value demonstration that creates trust in digital transformation. If you go about digital transformation and you think about cost out, automation, people get nervous. They, want, they, they feel that now jobs are threatened. If you, if you target marketing and sales, you're, you're, you're targeting trying to get more customers in. And that is, of course, something everybody likes. Starting transformation in marketing and sales recenters a company on its customers, meeting those customers and innovating for them. So uh, in closing, a company with uh, a, a customer-centric digital transformation has a great vision, purpose, and determination. They bring in great teams and technology. They have more brains than, than budgets. What they do, they do a lot, as we heard. They test, they learn, they scale, they repeat. They take risks and embrace failures as, as a ROI on learning, all the while measuring and analyzing. These companies become data-driven, they become agile, they become innovative and customer obsessed, and with that, they earn the love from their consumers. With that, thank you so much. Back to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Sven, for that really interesting uh, presentation.